we're bringing digital things into our world for the first time. And that's going to be incredibly radical. And I think there are very few things that you can work on as a technologist that is more meaningful than spatial computing, because spatial computing is ultimately the eyes and ears and the proprioception, the physical understanding of the world of AI. Nils, welcome to Real Vision. Thanks for joining us during Education Month. Uh, this is Tech Week, and we're here to talk about what I think is one of the coolest movements in tech, and that is the intersections of spatial computing or augmented reality and blockchain. I feel like you guys are definitely one of the more compelling companies exploring this space. So let's just dive right in. Um, to start, I want to help people understand your perspective of augmented reality. I think it's one of the more unique. Uh, views out there in the industry about what the tech is, was was capable of. You have a quip that I really enjoy. You say that augmented reality is language and language is augmented reality. Can you explain what you mean by that for our audience? Uh, of course. Uh, thank you for having me, Evan. The, the quip is about helping us understand how, in a way, augmented reality is the oldest technological project that humanity has. What I mean by that is language is how we manifest our imagination and knowledge in the minds of other people. This is ultimately what language is for. We use language to get our ideas to manifest inside the mind of someone else. And this is ultimately what augmented reality does. You can kind of show that augmented reality is language and that language is augmented reality um, by imagining that we were walking through a forest. This is an example I like to give. We imagine we're walking through a forest and we come across a fallen tree. If I point at that tree and I say, hey, Evan, look at that beautiful couch. The act of describing it as a couch actually impacts your perception of the scene. You can now see the sittingness of the tree. Uh, this is a game that probably everyone has played as a kid pointing at clouds and seeing, you know, what looks like a bunny, what looks like a dog. Language allows us to literally reach into someone else's mind and manifest our imagination in theirs. And this is one of the most deep, profound drives that we have as humans. We want to be understood. We want to connect. We want to collaborate so that we can build greater things together and preserve knowledge together. And I believe that augmented reality is the next big and maybe the second to final step in human communication before we do direct brain to brain communication. I love it. That's awesome. Yeah, this, this reminds me of a quote you guys like to use a lot from Terrence McKenna. He talks about some of the limits of language that aren't terribly intuitive. And there's a quote I want to read that you guys used in one of your articles and it goes, Language today is just small mouth noises moving through space, mere acoustical signals that require the, the consulting of a learned dictionary. This is not a very wide band form of communication, but with virtual or augmented realities, we'll have a true mirror of the mind, a form of telepathy that could dissolve boundaries, disagreement, conflict, and a lack of empathy in the world. Pretty, pretty powerful stuff. I completely agree that AR has potential to do just that. And Terrence McKenna, he had quite the prescient perspective of this future and what this tech could mean. It's someone that you look up to and I think you try to fold in a lot of his ideas and wisdom into your company, into your culture, into your mission. Can you talk a little bit about what Terrence McKenna got right about this future and what it is about his visions that, that draw you to him so much? I think Terrence McKenna understood the role that language has played in not just human history, but in cosmic history. Uh, listening to Terence McKenna made me understand that in the grand scheme of capital H history, what's happening is that information is starting to propagate itself and that that's really, really radical. Um, he believed that with the advent of the internet and with virtual reality, uh, augmented reality wasn't even really a, a term that anyone used back in his day. But he believed that with the advent of these technologies, 
humans would essentially turn themselves inside out, uh, make their, uh, their insights, their ideas, their learned experiences, uh, be what defines them rather than their, their phenotypic expression. The things that make us human, if you listen to Terence McKenna, is our language and everything that we make with our language. Viewing the world through the eyes of Terence McKenna is understanding that the whole world is made up of language. A blueprint is language. The instructions to the construction crew is language. How to decorate the inside of the apartment is language. It's all made up of language. And understanding that we ourselves are just a part of that cosmic drama and not necessarily in the center of that cosmic drama, I think puts you in a good headspace to, uh, to sit and meditate on the coming of AI as well and our, our future companions and the propagation of information. Propagation of information. I feel like that's another way to talk about something else that you're really obsessed with, which is memes. And if what I'm hearing is right, that AR is language, language is AR. AR is the ultimate technology to propagate memes. And memes is something that's pretty embedded into crypto culture. It's embedded in the culture in general. Um, it, it shapes society in many ways. I think the way you talk about memes is really compelling. Can you talk about how you think about memes, how you think about the role of AR in deploying memes, understanding memes? So to preempt anyone accusing me of having a sense of humor, usually when I, I talk about so, memes, so, so. Um, it's not funny pictures on the internet. I, I don't always have the capacity for that. But uh, in 1979, uh, Richard Dawkins, uh, the biologist, wrote a popular science book called The Selfish Gene, where he presented the neo-Darwinian perspective on evolution. And in this book, he coined the term meme. Uh, not everyone knows this, but the word meme is actually uh, from 1979, uh, way before the first cat had the first cheeseburger. And what, <laughs> um, what he meant by meme in that book was the idea that just as natural selection acts on our genes, um, natural selection is best understood not as acting on species or tribes or even individuals. It acts at the level of genes. Maybe natural selection also acts on our culture, on our behavior. And he invented the word meme to be a stand-in for a gene in that analogy. A meme is a unit of cultural transmission. It is a, a unit of behavior. So the word meme is a meme. Waving is a meme. Having the buttons in front of the shirt is a meme. All kinds of behaviors that we can copy are memes. And I believe very much, again, in the capital H history, that we are now in the age of memes, ideas that propagate themselves. Survival of the fittest when it comes to information is information that propagates itself. And we are now living in the century, in the decade, where the meme is starting to talk about itself, like we are in this conversation. And I, I, I think that's a, a radical moment in the history of the universe. Hey, sorry to interrupt again. Uh, it's Raoul here from Real Vision. I'd love for you to subscribe to the channel, get the notifications. We have so many incredible conversations with so many amazing people. It will really help you in your financial journey and your journey to understand just what the hell's going on in this world. Anyway, click subscribe, get the notifications and enjoy. Meta memes. So it sounds to me like um, this is one of the core drivers of why you're building, building Alki Labs. The way I think about Alki is you guys are really trying to build the right type of canvas for AR, for language, for memes. Um, some people in the space call this canvas the AR cloud. I don't think many of our listeners probably know what the notion of the AR cloud is. Um, can you give the more broad definition of the AR cloud and then maybe go into how you guys are thinking about it and approaching it? Sure. So the AR cloud and spatial computing, I think are two terms we will need. We will need both to understand one and the other. Um, if we start with spatial computing, spatial computing is essentially the ability for digital devices to understand the 
physical world, understand their movement to the physical world or what they're seeing in the physical world. Um, because digital devices don't have an inherent understanding of the physical world. So spatial computing is the attempt to invite digital things into our world. The AR cloud is um, the entirety of the stack that humanity is building to try to allow for spatial computing and augmented reality specifically where for the device to be able to even interpret what it's seeing through, through its camera, it needs to have some kind of digital counterpart that it can cross-reference, um, a digital twin of the world. And that digital twin of the world is much too big to fit inside one device. Uh, it's much too complex to be reasoned about by a single device. And the AR cloud is a, a cloud, uh, you know, a, a bunch of someone else's computers that are, are working hard to help your device uh, understand the physical world. Got it. So we're creating digital twins, creating these 3D reconstructions of physical space. How are some of the main players approaching this today versus the way that you're trying to do, which I believe is more of a decentralized bottoms up approach? So one of the first things you want to do in spatial computing is help the device understand its movement, position, and rotation in space. Um, we don't often think about it now, but I think we'll start thinking about it a lot more this year and moving forward. But digital devices don't have a very good understanding of where they are in the world. Uh, they have the GPS, sure, but GPS is not a very precise uh, technology. And it's a line of sight technology. You actually need to have an uninterrupted line of sight to several satellites to be able to get a really good uh, accuracy of where you are, which means that my GPS could not place me in this hotel room. It can barely place me in this hotel. It cannot place me on this floor. It cannot place me in this hotel room. And it certainly can't put me in this chair or know that my phone is in my right hand and not in my left hand. Why would you need such pinpoint accuracy? Well, you need that kind of pinpoint accuracy to do things like augmented reality where you want digital information to be anchored in physical space. If you can't describe, well, there are two things that you need. One, you need to be able to describe precisely where the information is, which technically you could do with a GPS coordinate. But if your phone or your glasses can't resolve its own GPS coordinate, uh, then it doesn't really help how precisely you've described the piece of information. So one of the big, big arms races in spatial computing is positioning. And the most popular way to tackle that today is visual positioning. Visual positioning um, is by far the, the most popular approach to how to teach a device where it is. And visual positioning basically means that you are going to analyze what the device is seeing through its optical sensor, typically a camera, and compare that to the digital twin, typically in the AR cloud, um, and calculate based on comparing the camera data and the digital twin where the device is. And uh, that makes it possible to position the device in the right circumstances where there is a good digital twin, and the environment is not too dynamic, you can position it with centimeter accuracy. It's very, very impressive. Um, at a really grand scale, Google, uh, it's not that recent anymore. I think it was uh, the summer of 22 or 21. They uh, released the spatial API, which is you know, maybe one of the great wonders of, of tech, where they took literally billions of photos taken by Google Street View. And they threw those photos into a, a very fancy machine learning tumble dryer that spat out a 3D representation of everything that Google Street View has seen. And using that 3D representation, they provided an API that allows a device like this one to share its camera feed with Google's AR cloud. And Google's AR cloud will then tell my device uh, down to about half a meter of accuracy in uh, most uh, urban places in the world where I am, which is, is uh, considerably better than GPS. 
So that's super, super impressive. Uh, the downside that you, you may have caught on to here uh, is that you are always sharing your camera feed with someone else's computer. Uh, in the case of Google, you're sharing your camera feed with Google. The way it works is you tell me what you're looking at, I'll tell you where you are, uh, which is obviously not very privacy conserving. And it's not uh, something that people think about too much now when our main computing device is handheld and spends a lot of time in our pocket where there's nothing to see. But if people like Niantic have their way and there will be a pair of consumer AR glasses that you wear out and about uh, that are positioned with visual positioning, then what that means is that these companies will literally have to be looking through our eyes all the time for the device to even work. Like it doesn't work if the camera isn't on. Like it literally doesn't work if you're not sharing your camera feed. So then you have to trust this provider not to be spying on you while you're quite actively sending them everything that you're looking at. Uh, and not just what you're looking at, but also how you feel about what you're looking at. Because a lot of these new headsets also uh, now track how your eyes react to what you're looking at. So they know where you're looking. They know how you feel about what you're looking. And this is um, one of the biggest threats, if not the greatest threat uh, to human privacy that uh, the tech industry has concocted so far. And what we are trying to do at the intersection of decentralization and blockchain and spatial computing is to allow for this positioning service to be decentralized. So instead of there being one great digital twin of the world, like Google's great digital twin of the world, um, instead you have these micro relationships with smaller digital twins that maybe you trust more. Google should not have a copy of what my space looks like. I should have a copy of what my space looks like. And it should be up to me whether or not I let your device connect to my space and do AR in here. The, and that's ultimately what we're building towards with this protocol we call the, the post mesh. Post mesh. So if I had to summarize that, basically the AR cloud is like an API to the world. And the implications of that for any application that requires knowledge about location and context is, is massive, but inherently that data is incredibly intimate data. It's about where we are, who we're with, what we're saying, what we're looking at. And then what you said earlier, is you, even how we're thinking, feeling, and reacting because these devices can read our facial expressions. You know, the Apple watch can measure our heart rate and it literally is going to be a bevy of data that is an insight into like our inner being, inner thinking, inner wants, needs, and desires. So to have that data live in some centralized server that's not accessible and opaque um, is a concern. And so you guys are trying to basically, a lot of people take that same data, that intimate private data, and put it on their own server and take that same 3D map that would be an AR cloud and have their own personal AR cloud. Yeah. So I think that's a pretty powerful idea. And you, so you guys are using this pose mesh is the protocol to do that. Can you talk to us about what, what pose mesh is exactly and, and how it works and where does, where does a token come into play? So, uh, the name pose mesh comes from, from two words that once you, once you know it, you can't unsee it. Once you see it, you can't unsee it. Uh, pose is the, um, the term for something's position and rotation in three dimensional space. So not just where I am, but what what way I'm facing. That's the technical term for that, the pose. And a mesh is, uh, well, one, uh, it's a, a mesh network, which is ultimately what we're building. But for people familiar with 3D and uh, with AR, uh, the mesh is also uh, typically used to describe the digital representation of what the, the physical space is shaped like. So the post mesh is a network of devices that are trying to reason about their posts. That's what the, the post mesh is. And they're trying to do this collaboratively. The, the big swing that we made in 2021, uh, when we, we raised um, $19 million in seed funding, uh, was we, we came out with a bit of a heterodox story about augmented reality. And we said that what augmented reality is missing is not a smaller headset or longer battery life or 
even a, a better AR game or anything like that. What's missing is that if you don't have good positioning, you can't have shared experiences where you see the same thing in the same place. And if you can't do that, then you can't use AR for language. And ultimately, AR wants to be language. So the thing that's missing, our hypothesis was uh, the positioning part in a way that allows for shared AR sessions. That's what's, what's missing. And uh, to do shared AR, there are a couple of things uh, that you need to do really well. Of course, you need to do the positioning well, but you also need to do latency very, very well. Um, when you want to do a shared AR experience and you are looking at digital things in the real world, a lot of the things that you can do with traditional games are not available to you. Uh, if we were playing a game of Counter-Strike uh, against each other, if we have a little bit of laten latency, uh, we are less likely to notice that because we can't see each other's screen at the same time. Right? We can't see each other's screen at the same time. But when you are rendering on top of the real world, the real world is the same for everyone. And you need to make sure that uh, you can communicate the information between uh, every participating device fast enough not to break the illusion. So shared augmented reality needs lower latency than any mainstream internet application, which puts a lot of, of, of pressure on AR as a medium. And one of our foundational hypotheses for how to get lower latency was that the AR cloud has to be broken up into tiny little chunks spread all over the world. So rather than connecting to big data centers, uh, the way that uh, the people like Google are building their AR cloud, instead we would have to build a substrate of microservers that are hyper local. The idea is that when you try to do something co-located with me, if we're in the same room and we're trying to see something in AR, uh, that we should be connected to a small private server that's really only dealing with uh, our traffic at the moment, and it's doing so with lower latency than a bigger cluster further away could do. So this was uh, before D-PIN had really become a, a talking point that I, I could hang the story on. Now, luckily, D-PIN is here as a scaffolding uh, that I can use to tell the story. But essentially, what we wanted to do was to build a, a decentralized physical infrastructure for the AR cloud and have it be community run. Because ultimately, there's no way for us as an organization practically to be running thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of these microservers all over the world and ensure uptime. This, that's a work that has to be distributed out to the market. And the token comes into play there in a way that allows the protocol uh, not only to uh, reward people for providing uh, that infrastructure to the network, but also for them to um, put their own reputation and finances at stake uh, to be, make a promise that they will actually deliver the service and won't just drop the traffic or uh, spend their compute on something else that would deteriorate the, the experience for the person trying to use the network. So the, the first thing that the token does inside the post mesh is allow for people to stake into the network and say like, look, I have some compute that's available that could uh, be part of the post mesh and could help route these messages around um, and also earn rewards for, for doing that. When devices use their specific machine, then they get rewarded for that. Or if they put up the machine in a part of the world where the foundation that manages the, the token economy feels is particularly valuable, uh, then the foundation will also directly reward those nodes for participating. And uh, in a more long-term vision of what the Postmesh and the token will do is essentially allow for collaborative and distributed spatial computing where your device might provide sensor data, but my device will provide some CPU and some other device will provide some storage. Um, because our working hypothesis is like, how do you get the glasses to be smaller, actually? So you have to move a lot of the compute out of the glasses and you need to allow for, uh, for the compute to be done collaboratively. 
And for the compute to be done collaboratively, we've been uh, very inspired by something that Naval Ravikant wrote in, I think, 2014, where he wrote about the internet needing uh, a new protocol that would allow for machines to reason about and exchange value with each other. And he used a very prescient example uh, in that post where he said, well, imagine we have a city full of self-driving cars, um, maybe all self-driving cars, and we need to do things like negotiate lane merging, right? Um, the ultimate, there, there are two ways that we can imagine such a system. It's either controlled centrally, and there's some central authority that decides who gets to merge and who doesn't. Or we leave it like up. Like Tesla, right? Tesla already has that kind of spatial mapping going on. They have a supercomputer. They have cars that could all talk to each other. So Tesla could be the one orchestrating this. Or Absolutely. Or you try to have some interoperable protocol where the uh, cars can have an economic preference, probably the economic preference of the passenger or the owner. They said like, look, I want to get to where I'm going this bad. I am willing to pay you a cent to let me merge in front of you, et cetera, in, in Naval's example. The idea was that even in a post, you know, scarcity society from, from the point of view of humans, there are always going to be certain things that are quite scarce from the point of view of the computer, uh, at least in the foreseeable future, things like battery um, and sensor data, et cetera, and allowing energy in general. Yes. And allowing the devices to not only have an economic preference, but be able to negotiate and with and pay for data from other devices, et cetera, uh, is something that I, I, I think is key to make something like the post mesh, um, live a healthy life beyond any individual corporate interest. Uh, because one of the things that I think you need to do well, also, if you're building the post mesh, uh, and you want to build it in a way that is not leaning towards surveillance, capitalism, and dystopia is you need to build up a, a protocol that ultimately, uh, is not dependent uh, on us as a company. It will live on, it will be open source. It becomes a foundational part of the internet itself. And if you're gonna build a foundational part of the internet itself that deals with scarce resources this way, um, I think Naval is right on the money that you need a, a protocol for how to allow the machines to reason about value and exchange value with each other. And uh, when he wrote that piece, uh, he was talking about how cryptocurrencies are very likely going to end up being that protocol uh, of the internet. Regardless of if cryptocurrencies become that layer of the internet, we are making a bet on using uh, blockchain as a part of the PostMesh stack. The PostMesh itself is not a blockchain, but the PostMesh reputation and reward system that allows these devices to uh, trust each other and exchange value with each other, that component is handled by a blockchain to allow for the trustless exchange of value uh, between the Postmesh participants outside of our uh, central participation. That's exciting stuff. So to me, this network sounds so vital because it's not just about spatial computing in the form of augmented reality headsets, but you mentioned cars. Um, it's really any autonomous system that has a camera on it. So that's our AR glasses, that's cars, that's drones, that's humanoid robotics, any other kind of robotic delivery drones. There are so many um, machines that need to have this type of network to tap into. The reason why this mission excites me is because one of the reasons people get so worried about the exponential age is the question, what are humans going to do and how are humans going to make money? This is one of those more niche examples that no one thinks about as to how other people can make money. And so towards that end, you guys are using a token as an incentive mechanism. And for people listening, this is a crypto forward crowd. People might be familiar with um, the Helium network, which uses um, just doing something similar, I believe, for, for bootstrapping a 5G network, right? Where any kind of piece of compute um, or router uh, could be I could install it. I could give you know, people access to a 5G um, network. 
you guys are doing that for 3D maps of, of spaces. Can you break down for us what this economy looks like? Because there's, there's multiple players, the tokens move in some unique ways, um, and there's lots of challenges right now with trying to bootstrap these types of networks, right? There's lots of speculation, people come and they leave. And I'm curious how you guys are attacking those problems. So can you just break down the economy of the PoseMesh network? I think there's a foundation, right? And then talk about how you're kind of overcoming some of these challenges that are inherent to tokens and to something that looks and feels like money and that accrues value. So there are a couple of jobs that need to be done by computers and their owners for the post mesh to function well. In no particular order, uh, we've already talked about low latency networking and the bet that we are taking with our protocol on using ubiquitous microcomputers, things like smart TVs and routers and uh, computers that are already out in the world um, that have spare CPU cycles, and more importantly, they have spare bandwidth. They're typically connected to unmetered internet where they don't pay per megabyte, where, uh, you know, you can think of it a little bit of uh, as Airbnb for microcompute. This is one thing that we need to do well, but uh, low latency is only one part of it. And the 3D map is another part, right? And the difference between low latency networking and the 3D map is low latency networking has no requirement of persistence. The data does not have to survive until tomorrow. We're just exchanging messages as fast as we can. But when we're making a 3D map that we want to be able to return to, then that 3D map has to be persistently stored. And not just persistently stored, but it has to be served in real time to people that are uh, that are trying to connect to that domain, as we call it. We call a, a domain uh, the digital representation of a physical space. So now we can already see three kinds of jobs that computers can have uh, inside the post mesh. One is to be a networking relay. One is to be a domain server, which is the machine that answers participants with information about the domain, like literally serves it over the network in real time. When someone asks, is there a, a wall in front of me? You know, the, the, the domain server would, would answer that question. But we also need a uh, replication where the data in the domain server is backed up in other places in case the domain server wants to leave the network or has some fatal error or gets overloaded some way. So clearly three jobs at least. Um, that computers can do in the post mesh. But on top of this, there are also trust and performance issues where uh, the protocol needs to know that no one is lying about uh, the work that is being done there to extort uh, value from the protocol and get paid for work that didn't happen. So uh, some sort of, uh, you know, I'm reluctant to say proof of work because this is a crowd where proof of work means something, but proof of having done something uh, is also important. And uh, proof of contribution. Proof of contribution. And so another uh, role within the post mesh that we are hopefully rolling out this year is something a little bit like a validator where really what you're doing is you are uh, randomly selected to view interactions between other participants in the post mesh and uh, provide your third party account of what happened there uh, so that uh, there's no funny business going on. So now there are at least four different jobs, right? That, um, that four jobs that the post mesh needs computers to do, right? It needs, network how do you educate people? I guess, so, sorry to interrupt, but like, I think one of the biggest hurdles here is just to get people to understand the complexity of such an economy and a network and how they can add value. How do you guys approach the challenge of just awareness and, and marketing this as something that's viable to people? With difficulty. Uh, <laughs> with, the, the, with language, you need AR to better communicate it. We, um, we try to build in public. Uh, we have a discord community where we talk openly about how we build and the challenges we face. Cause we have to be honest about the fact that we don't have all the answers. No one does. 
And we have to build really quickly anyhow, because there's a race against the clock, we believe, because we, you know, we believe AR is fundamentally just unstoppable technology. It's coming. And that means we have to build it in a decentralized way before it's already been built in a centralized way. The way we learned with social media that, you know, once you've let something out of Pandora's box, it's very hard to put it back in. It's very hard to, to put it back in. So we go to work every day feeling a great time pressure that, you know, we have to build something that's not just an alternative, uh, but it has to be the superior alternative, not just morally, but technically and performance wise. So to do that, we try to build publicly to find contributors that are, uh, that are passionate and, and, and join. Uh, some of our best contributors were, uh, were found through these community uh, outreach. Our head of developer relations and our creative technologist, Tracy, is a great example of someone that literally uh, found us through our Discord and, and now is a very key contributor in our, in our project. Uh, but also we, we use language. We talk, we write, we go on podcasts. We write long form articles and try to uh, shape the conversation about what spatial computing is and what it can be. One of the projects that I feel very passionately about is we work with uh, science fiction writers uh, and ask them to write stories about future with spatial computing, not as a fluff piece for us. We just say, you know, here's the technology that we think is coming. Can you write a story about the near future, how you think this technology will impact us? And that becomes a learning experience for us as well. Like we get to read these stories and see uh, potential pitfalls of how things are being built and uh, the dangers that it can create. The first story um, that was written by someone outside of our team was written by Alistair Reynolds, uh, one of my favorite science fiction authors from, from when I was a kid. He wrote a fantastic short story called End User, uh, which, you know, the first three times I read it, I got goosebumps because he had captured something that can very easily happen with augmented reality technology if we're not careful and if it's not built in a decentralized way. And I, I find myself returning to that piece often to educate myself, right? Like, like why is this important? Um, but to get back to the question, you know, how, how do we educate people? It's, it's hard. You know, we try to build in public. I, th I think right? you just said it, right? It's, it's, it's the science fiction narratives. I think science fiction has become no longer just a tool for entertainment and for fantasy and for narrative. It's, it's a tool to educate now because it's not fantasy, it's reality. And the only way we're going to get people to adopt these tools and to do so with, with gusto, <laughs> not with fear, I think is, is by telling you stories and both the dystopian and the utopian stories are equally as important, right? Cause you won't get people using your platform unless they see the dystopian outcome. Otherwise that's the problem statement of any good investor pitch deck, right? To get them to care and lean in. And then you can counter that with a utopian story about here's the alternative. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm super bullish on sci-fi as a key part of any go-to-market strategy for any company working this exponential age. So, so we got a bit sidetracked from the, the, the token space. Um, to recap, there's, there's four different contributions one could make to this network. We can get rewarded in a token. Um, so that's, that's, we'll call it the supply side of the network. Um, on the demand side, you have, you have developers. Can you talk about how you guys are trying to solve that chicken or egg problem that's inherent to any kind of two-sided marketplace conundrum? Um, so the first thing we did um, that we were uh, very fortunate to get to do was we created two legal entities. We created one legal entity that is building the protocol and uh, one legal entity that is building applications on top of the protocol. And that allowed us to raise money separately for building the first uh, applications on top of the protocol. So uh, seven of the 19 million we raised was raised towards building the first experiences on that protocol. And then on top of that, there's of course a, uh, you know, the token is launching later this month. And as part of the token ecosystem, there is a sizable 
a treasury and ecosystem reward pool that will be used to incentivize people to come and build on this platform. So uh, short term, arguably the largest rewards you can get for participating is not being on the supply side, but actually being on the demand side and building things on, on top of the protocol. Because we understand, of course, and our backers understand that there is this time window that I talked about. Like we need to very aggressively get people to adopt this technology rather than, for example, what Niantic is building. Um, because or what Apple's building. I think that's or, the more yeah. important thing to consider here is that um, in terms of the commercials here, right, today, if Apple builds the AR cloud or Google, there's this app store. There's a huge tax you got to pay. They take a ton of revenue and have all the upside. And yeah, sure, you can make money as a business, but relative to the value you're adding, you're not capturing nearly the upside that the company is. But in this case, as a developer, as a creator, I have equity effectively in the place I'm choosing to build on and build with. So I think that's a huge deal. I, I think that's very important. And I, I want to take a few steps back, uh, you know, because um, when you and I are talking to each other, we're preaching to the choir. Uh, we, we both <laughs> work in the spatial computing space and we know how much money is being spent by these companies to build these things. But for the, for mm -hmm. the sake of, of Real Vision's audience, I want to just uh, load the context that spatial computing uh, was arguably, at least from Silicon Valley's point of view, the real thing that was happening with hashtag metaverse, right? Um, when, when people like Mark Zuckerberg or Jensen Huang talk about metaverse, they're not talking about NFTs. They are talking about spatial computing. And just for scale, I think this is important for uh, the crypto community to remember. In the previous bull run, Meta fired more engineers than there were active contributors to Web3 at the time. Like Web3 is massively outgunned when it comes to the amount of engineers. Meta literally fired more engineers in the last bull run than there were contributing engineers to Web3 at the height of the bull run. It's a hell of a stand-up. So there is an enormous amount of money going from Google, Microsoft, Apple, Snap, you name it, trying to become leaders in spatial computing. When Apple announced the Vision Pro, if you listen to what Tim Cook said, he said that just as the Mac introduced us to personal computers and the iPhone introduced us to mobile computers, the Vision Pro will introduce us to spatial computers. It's hard to overstate how seriously you should take that statement. What Apple believes is that after mobile computers is spatial computers. And as a listener, you shouldn't think that, oh, what it means is that we're going from phones to glasses. That's not what's happening. What's happening is we're going from uh, the internet being indexed, you know, in databases sorted alphabetically, blah, 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 by uh, being indexed by physical location. Digital information is moving into physical space and you're going to start looking through computers more. Uh, your, your Android or iPhone is already a spatial computer, uh, most of the, the new phones. Like this iPhone is definitely a spatial computer. It's been a spatial computer for a long time. The big shift that's happening is that the internet is becoming indexed by physical location. And this is a multi-trillion dollar opportunity. And one of the perverse incentives here is that if a company like Microsoft or Google or Apple can own the infrastructure that solves the positioning, then that's very much like kind of owning uh, the next part of the internet. Imagine a world where you know, Intel owned the internet. That would be a very, very different internet to grow up on. Uh, but that's literally what's at stake and why there are so many billions of dollars being spent by these companies on spatial computing. The biggest thing to have happened to computers since the internet is spatial computing. And it's very easy to, to miss that if you don't know what it is these companies mean when they say spatial computing and what it is they mean when they say metaverse. Um, because I assure you, Mark Zuckerberg 
when he talks about the metaverse being the future, there's no part of him that means that, oh well, yeah, like in the future, we'll all have profile pictures, blah, blah, blah. That's not what it is. What it is, is he believes we're going to move over to devices that have a physical understanding of the world, like his VR headsets and the upcoming AR headsets. Andrew Both Bosworth, uh, Meta's CTO, just a few days ago said that Meta's AR glasses prototype is the most advanced piece of technology that humanity has produced as a species. Like they are really, really trying to win the spatial computing race. And I think the decentralization movement should pay very close attention because this could be a much more important battleground than even the decentralization of the banking system. If I can be a bit of a Cassandra here, you know, who knows if in a, a post AI world, money will even be that meaningful. You know, at the end of the day, the world has functioned with money for some time now. Uh, but we have never seen what the world will be like with centralized spatial computing. And the, the, decentralization com the decentralization community should pay very close attention to how much money and how much effort, how many engineering years are being spent every day yeah. on uh, owning this yeah, piece of critical it's infrastructure. Crazy how much money, yeah, it's crazy how much money Facebook and Apple and Microsoft are putting into this space and people aren't really talking about this. They're starting to, they're starting to wake up to it for sure. Now, the, I guess my concern here is I think it's safe to say that Apple and the Vision Pro is probably going to be the lead horse in the near future with the most superior tech. Um, if there's a world where the Apple headset, Apple glasses win, it's a very closed ecosystem. Is, is the Pose Mesh Foundation and is, is, is Alki Labs in trouble in that world that happens? Or are there other ways in which you guys can still thrive, you think? And of course, I assume one argument would be, oh, there's the Android more open and it's going to be the close approach too, but are there ways for Apple users to tap into your network? You think, if it's, if they remain close, there are definitely ways for Apple users to tap into the network. Um, you know, it, it, even iPhones can use AWS, right? It, it's not that close to an ecosystem. Uh, most of the development we do are on Apple devices. Uh, Apple devices are the best spatial computing devices out there already uh, when it comes to, to handheld. Um, I think that Apple has treated AR very responsibly so far, sometimes so responsibly that it's even a little frustrating because a lot of people, you know, would love to have access to the camera feed for a bunch of cool features. But uh, Apple has been very, very protective about their users' data, which I think is great. And if I can wear my tinfoil hat just for a little bit, the, the two years prior to the Vision Pro being released, a really, really big deal for uh, Apple's marketing was privacy. iPhone, that's privacy, or privacy, that's iPhone, whatever that campaign was. And I remember thinking as soon as I saw that, the headset's coming, the headset's coming. Because it's, it's about preparing people. Because now we're scanning the room. Safe. Yeah, now we're right. scanning the room. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I think... At the risk of sound like an, sounding like an Apple fanboy, I think it's probably good for the world uh, if Apple comes out the lead uh, in AR because I think it will, will shape the privacy narrative quite a bit. I don't uh, think that Apple is in a position to win the entire computing industry in the spatial computing era um, in the immediate short term. But I'm convinced that Apple believes that those are what the stakes are. That if you do this really, really well, you know, Apple went from being obscure to being one of the most valuable companies in the world. Uh, a big part of that was how they saw the transition from the personal computer to the laptop to, to the mobile computer and how well they ushered humanity through that transition. And I'm, I'm sure they believe that... Uh, as we go into the spatial computing era, they can increase the size of the pie a lot and their share of the pie by even more. Uh, I am more worried yeah, about said actors about, like about Niantic. Apple. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, Apple, Apple's a master of marketing. They're a master of telling, telling stories that make their products cool. And 
one of the most noticeable things about the Apple Vision Pro announcement is they didn't use the word metaverse once. In fact, I think they avoided like the plague. They might even ban the word metaverse internally. Why is that word you think so polarizing and how do you navigate it? I, I, I'm starting to become more like Apple and trying to use the word less. But how do you think we, we rectify it? Because like the word's out of the bag. Um, it's useful in some context for marketing. Meta still uses it. How do you see that word evolving over time? And what's your approach to talking about that word with people who are polarized by it? The metaverse means different things to different people, which is something we haven't been honest about or even uh, necessarily aware of. You know, we, we have backers both that have come at this from a spatial computing perspective and people that have come from, from a decentralization and blockchain perspective. And when they talk to us about metaverse, they talk about completely different things, which is kind of how I got savvy to the fact that, oh, hold on, there's a disconnect between what crypto means when they talk about metaverse and what Mark Zuckerberg talks about when he talks about metaverse. And it was clear, you know, that, that Twitter didn't necessarily understand that when, or crypto Twitter didn't understand that when they're like, oh, you know, d does, does Meta think that they can compete in the crypto? No, they, they don't. You think they're trying to do that. What they're trying to do is they're trying to compete with, with Apple and Google and Snap when it comes to spatial computing. We're having completely different conversations. And I think part of why the, the word has gotten so infectious was because it was so poorly defined. People that agree on what the metaverse are don't have bad exchanges about the metaverse. People that don't agree about what the metaverse is, they have bad exchanges uh, about what the metaverse is. Uh, I think the metaverse uh, as a word, as a meme, is still waiting for a dominant narrative to really define what the word is. And I think it's more likely uh, that the metaverse will be rehabilitated by Web2 than by Web3 just because of how much bigger Web2 is and how much more money is going into this. Um, yeah, uh, as I said, there are more engineers working at any of the companies, Apple, Google, Microsoft, than in the entirety of blockchain engineering. So when they, if they decide to really talk about the metaverse, that's what will shape the conversation. And we already saw that uh, when Meta renamed, because the mainstream media started talking about VR headsets and not uh, digital ownership, right? The people that talked about digital ownership was the decentralization community, the blockchain community, but you're not going to read about that in the mainstream media. The mainstream media is going to talk about how we're going to be living in the metaverse and we're going to be wearing VR headsets. Um, maybe, you know, if... <laughs> If I was a, a PR consultant for the decentralization movement, uh, I think I would tell the decentralization movement to pick another word than metaverse, because I think we lost that word already when it comes to describe things like digital ownership and equitable participation. All of these things are very important. It's a conversation we need to have, and we need to not confuse people uh, into them thinking we're talking about VR headsets when we're talking about uh, decentralized infrastructure, equitable participation, and digital ownership. We probably need a better word for that. Yeah, there's, there's so much nuance to, to Metaverse and its evolution. The way I've started to try to just encapsulate the whole thing is by trying to compress it into a sense that people can't agree with, or sorry, they can't disagree with, um, which is, it's just the internet, but it's more empowering and more experiential. And the more empowering part has to do with your data, where it lives, how it moves, and what you can do with it and how you can benefit from it. Experiential is the spatial computing part. It's the immersion. It's the fidelity. It's how you feel from an experience you're getting and how you're able to communicate with someone, which of course creates feelings all around for all involved, hence the collaboration piece. And at the end of the day, that's all we're trying to do, right? Is just live life and feel and feel good. And so that's what keeps me hopeful about this this future and why it's so important. Uh, to end on a bit of a philosophical note, when you're, when you're out at a bar talking to people and you tell them what you do and they, and they grimace about that future, right? They go, oh, it sounds so Black Mirror-ish. And you're like, yes, I'm trying to solve Black Mirror. But for them still, just the idea of AR glasses and digital information, and it all sounds like Black Mirror. How do you 
flip that narrative for them and get them to think differently and be aware of all the good that could come from this. What's kind of your main talk track in like an elevator pitch or even shorter? Bring it back to language. Um, if we can uh, invoke the great Terence McKenna again, he said that uh, a civilization can only evolve at the speed that its languages allows and can only be as glued together as the bandwidth of its languages will allow. Um, what follows from that is that one of the most radical things that you can do as a technologist and perhaps even as an effective accelerationist is to build the actual language stack, build the actual language stack. What spatial computing and augmented reality will do is empower us to have more and better language to communicate more clearly with each other, to better manifest our imagination and knowledge in the minds of others, to help other people see what we mean and to see what other people mean so that we can collaborate more effectively, we can love each other better, we can be a better species. Um, I think everyone knows deep down that language is our friend and not our enemy. And we might lose track of that if we think of AR and blockchain intersecting with Pokemon Go clones with NFTs, rather than thinking about, no, 10 years from now, how we communicate with AR is going to be as impactful to human communication as chat rooms and emojis and video calls have been. Uh, we're about to enter a new age of human communication and the things that we will be able to accomplish as a species when we understand each other better. It's hard to even imagine from where we're standing now. Yeah. And one more layer on top of that, it's not just language for better communication amongst ourselves, but better communication with AI, right? Because now computers are becoming language oriented machines. And so how do we stay in the loop, right? How do we, I mean, they're going to become amazing, amazing companions to us. How do we remain companions back to them? How do we understand the insights that are gleaming? Um, it's not going to be just text in a text box. It's going to be visual representation of what the AI is learning about the, the forests, about the deep unexplored oceans, about space, about the nature of consciousness, even one day. Right. And so where that all spirals, where, where language takes us is amazing. And yeah, it's hard to argue that like, if you want to try to solve the most upstream problem, like that, if you want to solve problems and go the first upstream possible to solve them. It's probably better communication, right? Which leads to better empathy, better understanding and less conflict in the world. So if you would allow me to be a little bit cyberdelic, I would say that over the last few decades, humanity has been invited into the world of computers and we've gone into digital worlds. The great inversion that is happening now is that the digital beings are being invited into the physical world, spatial computing represents our desire to invite the digital things that we have made into our physical world, summoning the demon, if you will, or summoning angels, depending on how you see this, we're, we're bringing digital things into our world for the first time. And that's going to be incredibly radical. And I think there are very few things that you can work on as a technologist that is more meaningful than spatial computing because spatial computing is ultimately the eyes and ears and the proprioception, the physical understanding of the world of AI. When you're building spatial computing, you are building the sensory apparatus of our future AI companions. And that's a really meaningful thing to do. The sensory apparatus of our AI companions. That's a good way to end, I think. Cheers to that, Nils, here. Water cheers. Maybe we can do a beer cheers uh, sometime in the near future. Um, before we wrap here, how can people stay in touch with you, with Labs, follow y'all's progress, any, anything we can point them to? Uh, you can find us on alkylabs.com. You can follow the development of the PostMesh on postmesh.org. And uh, you can come hang out on our Discord, discord.gg slash alkyverse. Uh, I am brood sugar. Uh, B-R-O-O-D-S-U-G-A-R on Twitter. 
and my DMs are open. If you want to build something cool, I'm around. Brood sugar. We'll have to save my questions about that one for the next uh, interview, perhaps. But uh, amazing. Well, Nils, thanks for coming on um, Education Month and Tech Week here with Real Vision. And I uh, hope we can chat about it, uh, about your progress sometime in the near future and do this again. Thank you so much for having me. We hope you enjoyed the video. At Real Vision, we help you understand the complex world of finance, business, and the global economy with in-depth analysis from real experts. Join the revolution at realvision.com.